The diversity of living organisms on our planet is truly astonishing, almost overwhelming. Humans have come up with the ways of organizing or classifying biological diversity. In this lecture, we are going to discuss a branch of biology called taxonomy. It has nothing to do with IRS, but with organization of living things into certain groups, depending on their ancestry. Tax is a Greek word meaning arrangement. Nomi is also has Greek origin or etymology. In early 19th century, French language united these two words into one, taxonomy. Taxonomy is the science of organism based on presumed natural relationship. Thus, the organisms of our time have had common ancestors in the past. For example, animals grouped into classes. Class Cyclostomata comprises the living jawless fish. Cyclo means round, stomata means mouse. The lampreys and hagfishes are both belong to class Cyclostomata. Both groups have jawless mouse with horny epidermal structures that function as teeth. Here is class Pisces. Pisces means fish. There are about 33,600 species of fish have been identified and described by scientists. Class Amphibia. Amphibia refers to double life or life on, in water and on land. Salamandras, newts, frogs, toads, and amphibians, they are all closely related to each other and therefore combine in the class Amphibia. Reptiles as the most commonly identified are the animals in the class Reptilia. However, crocodilians are more closely related to birds than they are to other living reptiles. And so modern classification systems include birds within Reptilia. What I showed you on this slide is an old system of classification. There are about 10,000 species of birds worldwide occupying almost all Earth's habitats. They are assigned to the class Avis in British English, Fs in American English, but the correct pronunciation, I believe, is Latin pronunciation. In Latin, this would be read as Avis. Avis sounds pleasant enough as well. All mammals share at least three characteristics not to found in other animals. That is, three middle ear bones, hair, and production of milk by modified sweat glands called mammillary glands. All these classes are originated from a common ancestor. Thus, they all belong to the phylum cardata, which means vertebrates. We will talk about this in more details later during this lecture. So this is why we define taxonomy as a branch of biological sciences that is basis classification of organisms on the presumed natural relationship. Another way to define taxonomy is to say that taxonomy is the science of classifying, identifying, and naming organisms. This means that taxonomy consists of three components, classification, identification, and nomenclature. Classification is the arrangement of organisms into group based on similar characteristics, evolutionary similarity, or common ancestry. These groups are also called taxa, singular taxon. We just looked at the taxon called class. It was just an example of taxa. There is more taxa that breaks classes into orders, families, genera, and species. I will elaborate on this in a minute from now. Identification is the process of observing and classifying organisms into standard group that is recognized throughout biological community. Nomenclature is the name given to each organism. Every time new organism is discovered, it has to have its own name. So scientists have to come up with a Latin name for the organism. Carl Linnaeus, Swedish botanist, is known as the father of taxonomy. In 1735, he introduced formal system of classification. He grouped living things into two kingdoms. Kingdom Planty plants, which includes both flowering and non-flowering plants, ferns, and mosses, and animalia, animals. Note, he used Latin to classify organisms. 
Linnaeus was the first naturalist to include man within the animal kingdom. In 1735, the class into which Linnaeus inserted man called quadrupeds and the order Anthropomorpha. Later in his career, he changed these names to mammals and primates. Besides this, Linnaeus developed binomial nomenclature to identify species. By in Latin stands for two. And nominal has Greek origin and means part or portion. So species are named by using two words. For example, the species that you and all other living human beings on this planet belong to is Homo sapiens. As you see, the name of this species consists of two words. Homo means human in Latin. And sapiens means wise in Latin. As you notice, the adjective in Latin can be placed after the noun, unlike in English. In English, they are always before the noun. So, the name of the human species will be read wise human. A very optimistic name we give for our species, aren't we? The scientific name for house cat is Felis catus. In Latin, Felis is cat. Catus is Latinized Old English for cat. So if we to translate scientific name Felis catus to English, it is cat, cat. Carl Linnaeus adapted a system for grouping similar species into a hierarchy of increasingly general categories species, genera, order, classes, etc. For example, here is a fox. Let's look to which group it belongs to. We will start with the largest taxonomic group of Linnaeus' time, the kingdom. It is most inclusive group of that time. This group combines all kinds of animals besides foxes. It includes worms, butterflies, starfishes, mussels, mosquitoes, fish, mice, rats, giraffes, crocodiles, elephants, humans, and so on. Let's go down to more specific group. Foxes belong to phylum cardata, which means in English vertebrates or animals that have backbone. Invertebrates do not belong to this group. The representative of this group are not only foxes, but mice, rats, elephants, fish, crocodiles, humans, uh, whales, snakes, uh, all animals that have backbone. From phylum, we are now going to even more specific group or taxon called class. We already mentioned this taxon earlier. I hope you remember it. So the foxes belong to the class Mammalia. This class includes all animals that have three middle ear bones, hair or fur, and produce milk by modified sweat glands called mammillary glands. In Latin, mama means breast. Next taxon is order. Foxes belong to order Carnivora. Carni in Latin means flesh. And vora in Latin means to devour. So the foxes belong to the meat-eating organisms such as wolves, dogs, cats, raccoons, bears, hyenas, and seals, to name just few. The most specific to order is family. Foxes belong to family Kennedy. Canis in Latin means dog. Kennedy is a biological family of dog-like carnivorans. Going further is even more specific taxon called genus. Foxes belong to genus Vulpis. Vulpis is a genus of the family Kennedy. The members of this genus are colloquially referred to as true foxes. Now we will go into even more specific taxon called species. The genus Vulpis contains 12 different species or true foxes. The one you see on this slide is the most widespread, the red fox, which has the scientific name Vulpis vulpis and is found across most of the northern hemisphere. Why do we use binomial Latin names in science? We do it to make life easier for biologists. For example, let's take a look at the jellyfish. Why a jellyfish is called a jellyfish? Is it a fish? No, it is not a fish. Jellyfish is not a scientific but common name for this organism. 
common names are often misleading. In order for an organism to be a fish, an organism has to have an endoskeleton. Jellyfish has no skeleton. It has no backbone like fish have. It has no fins and scales. So jellyfish is not a fish. It is a cnidarian. Cnidus in Latin means stinging needle. Cnidarians are found in many aquatic environments. They are soft-bodied stinging animals. Also among them see anemones and corals. Look at this organism. Common name is a crayfish. Is it a fish? No. This organism has exoskeleton, not endoskeleton. It does not have backbone. It does not have fins or scales. Crayfish are freshwater crustacean, close relative of a lobster. It is a small lobster-like crustacean, not a fish. Look at this organism. Common name is silverfish. But is it a fish? No, it is an insect. The scientific name of this insect is Lepisma saccharinum. Lepisma means to peel. And saccharinum literally means starch eater. You are more likely to meet this insect if you left spilled sugar or uh, starch in your kitchen storage cabinet. The name indicates that the silverfish diet consists of carbohydrates such as sugar or starches. As I indicated earlier, binomial names for the species were instituted by Carl Linnaeus. But note that the first word indicates the genus to which species belongs. The second parts in the species names indicate specific epithet refers to one of the species within the genus. Below you see the example of scientific names of silverfish, one of the fox species, and scientific name of house cat. Please note that scientific names for the species always written in italic. Genus is always starts with a capital letter, and the specific epithet is always written with low case. This is a strict rules in taxonomy. If you type these names differently, it will be considered as a serious mistake. Here is another rule in taxonomy. If you mention the species name for the first time in a paper, you have to write both genus and specific epithet. For example, Lipisma saccharinum. If you mention the scientific time second time, you are not to write the whole word of genus. You are to write only the first capital letter followed by period, and then you have to write the whole specific epithet, L. saccharinum. As I mentioned earlier, name of our species is Homo sapiens. Thus, we belong to genus Homo. How many species in this genus? What do you think? Do you know any? About nine species are known so far. But out of this, only one still be around, Homo sapiens. The rest are all become extinct. Only their fossils are found. So here they are. Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, Homo ergaster, Homo erectus, Homo antecessor, Homo helbergensis, Homo neantartelensis, Homo sapiens. Use of binomial names for species make it easier to learn how close species are related to each other. For example, the scientific name for leopard is Panthera pardus. The scientific name for a tiger is Panthera tigris. Thus, we can learn that both leopard and tiger belong to the same genus Panthera, but to a different species. The scientific name for jaguar is Panthera onca, which indicates that all three species, Panthera pardus, Panthera tigris, and Panthera onca, are members of the same genus Panthera. Moreover, the scientific name for African lion is Panthera leo. Just from the name, you can instantly see that leopards, tigers, jaguars, and lions are closely related because they are all members of the genus Panthera. However, they are not the same species, so binomial nomenclature is a quite handy tool to learn and communicate about living things around us. 
We just named many different species. But what are species? What means to be a species? Organisms belong to the same species if they can interbreed and produce viable, fertile offspring. The key words are viable and fertile offspring. Different species technically can have sex, but there will be no viable or fertile offspring. Here's an example. A mule is the offspring of the male donkey and a female horse. Donkey and horses are closely related but belong to different species. They are offspring. Mules cannot have offspring. So offspring of donkeys and horses are not fertile. Why? Because they belong to different species. Tyan, Tygon or Tyglon is the hybrid offspring of male tiger and female lion. However, this offspring cannot have offspring. It is not fertile. Why? Because tiger and lion are different species. Now we will look at the large taxonomic groups. And the one type of such group you are familiar with. What is it? Kingdoms. Remember, Carl Linnaeus proposed to divide all living things into two kingdoms, Plantae and Animalia. However, living things are too diverse to be put into two kingdoms. In 1969, Robert Whittaker proposed a new taxonomy that consisted of five kingdoms. Kingdom of protists, Kingdom of Monirans, Kingdom of Fungi, Kingdom of Plants, and Kingdom of Animals. But there is three different cell types on this planet. Therefore, in 1978, Carl Woese proposed elevating the three cell types to a level above kingdoms. He called this taxon domain. Now we identify them as two prokaryotic domains, bacteria and archaea, and one eukaryotic domain, eukarya. I hope you understand that this does not cancel the kingdoms. It means that these taxonomic groups are above kingdoms. Domains are more general and kingdoms are more specific. Later on, the kingdoms were revised and up to recently, there were six kingdoms. Let's take a look at them. So let me introduce you to these kingdoms. Kingdom of anima animals. Kingdom of plants, kingdom of fungi, kingdom of eubacteria or simply bacteria, kingdom of archaeobacteria or better to say archaea, and kingdom of protista. Let's take a look at the kingdom of animals first. It is easily identifiable and well-known kingdom. As you already know, animals are multicellular and eukaryotic. Animals live on land and in the water. No animal can make its own food. This means they are heterotrophic, not autotrophic. Most animals reproduce sexually, but a few capable to reproduce asexually. Here I will give random examples of animals. Mosquito is an animal. There are 3,600 different species of mosquitoes. Compare this to newts. There are only 100 species of newts. Fish is an animal. There are about 33,600 species of fish. There are 1,100 species of mice around the world. There are 17,500 species of butterflies. In the United States, we have 750 species of butterflies. There are 60,000 species of snails. Compare this to 100 species of newts. Amazing, isn't it? Humans. How many species of humans? One, Homo sapiens. Other species of humans became extinct during evolution. There are 2,000 species of sea stars. There are three species of elephants, African savanna elephant, African forest elephant, and Asian elephant. 
There are about 1 million species of worms on our planet. Each of them, of course, is assigned specific scientific name in Latin like any other species. But imagine the amount of work the biologists did. There are 2,000 species of frogs and toads identified and detailed described by scientists. These are just few random examples of animals. I bet you can give much more examples of animals such as flies, jaguars, hippopotamus, giraffes, bedbugs, and so on and so on. Enough! Let's take a look at another easily identifiable kingdom, kingdom of plants. This kingdom is comprised of non-flowering plants, for example, ferns, mosses, horsetails, conifers, cycads, and ginkgo. It is estimated that there are more than 30,000 species of non-flowering plants on Earth. However, 94% of all plants on our planet are flowering plants. Thus, there are 360,000 species of flowering plants were identified and described by scientists. All plants are multicellular and eukaryotic. Most plants live on land and lack the ability to move from place to place. Almost all plants make their own food through the process called photosynthesis. Another way to say it, plants are autotrophs. Most plants reproduce sexually. Some plants are able to reproduce asexually by runners, layering, or the use of cuttings. We will discuss this in our future lectures. Kingdom fungi includes mushrooms. This kingdom also includes yeast, including the ones that you use for baking, and those that cause fungal infections and moles. What do mushrooms, yeast, and moles have in common? Remember during our first lecture I told you that cell walls of plants are made of cellulose, and the cell walls of mushroom, yeast, and mold are made of the chemical called chitin. So this is what mushrooms, yeast, and moles have in common. They are cell walls made of the same chemical called chitin. Unlike plants, the cell walls of fungi do not contain cellulose. Fungi also are not able to make their own food. They must absorb nutrients from organic matter around them. But like plants and animals, fungi are eukaryotic organisms. This means that each cell in their body contains nucleus and other membranous organelles. Some fungi cause diseases in, their, in other organisms. Athletes' food caused by fungus, as are many diseases in plants. Most fungi live on land. Some species of fungi reproduce sexually, while others reproduce asexually. The kingdom bacteria is made up of one-celled organisms, or in other words, unicellular organisms. They are prokaryotic, which means they do not have a membrane surrounding their nucleus. But even though they are single cells, they are not simple organisms. They perform all the life functions that larger multicellular organisms perform, but they do, do it in a single cell. Bacteria can be found anywhere, in the air, in water, and on land. This organism reproduces through fission, the process by which one organism divides into two or more separate organisms. Archaea is a domain of unicellular organism. Like bacteria, these microorganisms lack cell nuclei and therefore prokaryotes. Archaea were initially classified as bacteria, receiving the name archaeobacteria in the archaeobacteria kingdom, but this term has fallen out of use. Archaeal cells have unique properties separating them from other two domains, bacteria and eukarya. Archaea and bacteria are generally similar in size and shape, but despite this morphological similarity to bacteria, archaea possess genes and several metabolic pathways that are more closely related to those of eukaryotes. Unfortunately, in this course, uh, we are not going to talk much about this group of organisms. A protist is an any eukaryotic organism that is not an animal, plant, or fungus. This is a highly diverse group of organisms.
While it is likely that proteins share a common ancestor, proteins do not form a natural group or clade. Therefore, some proteins may be more closely related to animals, plants, or fungi than they are to each other. The biological category protist is used for convenience. For a long time, kingdom Pratista has been linked to a trash can kingdom into which all the eukaryotes that are not plants, animals, or fungi have been thrown. Because of this reason, the kingdom Pratista had been cancelled for a long while already, but there was no other kingdom proposed. So the taxonomy of Protist hanging in, in the air. Now, different textbooks propose different ways of classification of this highly diverse organism that includes Paramecium, Euglena, Volvex, Slime Molds, and Amoeba, and myriads of others. Okay, enough about kingdoms. What do you see on this slide is taxonomic hierarchy of life. You see all the taxonomic groups we mentioned during this lecture. If we will look from the bottom to the top, we will go to from more general to more specific. If we will go from top to the bottom, we will uh, go from more specific to more general. Or we can say that from the bottom to the top, there will be increase in similarity. During identification of organisms, the names are written in the following order. Domain, kingdom, phyla, class, order, family, genus, species. How do you remember this? Well, there is a memory device that students remember for at least century. King Philip came over from Greece singing sons. K stands for kingdom, PH stands for phylum, C for class, and so on. The last S stands for subspecies. Sub means under. You see, often species are divided into subspecies. For example, a name of our species is Homo sapiens, but we are somewhat different from the cave people, which are the same species as us. Therefore, the name of our subspecies, and that is modern humans, is Homo sapiens sapiens, twice as wise. Well, thankfully, to keep modesty, we can write it as H.S. Sapiens. Now, at the end of the lecture, let's give full classification to us, humans. We belong to the domain Eukarya, along with all other animals, plants, and fungi. Why? Because we are eukaryotic organisms. We're made of eukaryotic cells, that is, cells that have nucleus and other membranous organelles. We belong to the kingdom Animalia because of our cellular similarities. We're made of the very similar cells. We belong to the phylum Cardata because like fish, snakes, turtles, crocodiles, birds, mice, tigers, and other vertebrates, we have backbone. So all animals with backbone belong to the phylum Cardata. We belong to the class Mammalia because, like other mammals, we're all covered with hair, except our palms and soles. Like other mammals, we have three middle ear bones, and we produce milk for our offspring. We belong to the order of primates. Like other primates, we have five-digit hands and feet possessing flat nails instead of claws. Like all primates, we have acute vision with depth perception. We belong to the suborder of Haplarini because, like other members of this suborder, we have flattened faces with forward facing eyes. We belong to the infraorder of Catarini. Infra means below, so as you see, there is such taxon as infraorder. This order is comprised of primates that have down facing nose and narrow nostrils. We belong to the superfamily of Hominaidae. The primates that have larger brains and no tail belong to this taxon. Also, the members of Hominaidae superfamily have high limb motility and broad pelvis. Super means above, so this taxon is just above family. 
We belong to the family Hominidae. In this family, all members have 32 teeth and large body size compared to other primates. We are in this family together with gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, and gibbons. And as you know it already, our genus is Homo. We are the only survivals of this genus. The rest of the members became extinct. Name of our species is Homo sapiens, and you know this already. Name of our subspecies is H.S. sapiens.